One of the great joys of life is having friends. What would life be like if we didn't have people that cared about us and that we could care about and to take care of one another? And the idea of friends has always been around, but the idea of having as a friend is a little different. In the days of Christ, you don't normally think of God as your friend. The Jews saw Jehovah as uh, somewhat fearsome. God's presence was in the temple or on the mountain, and, and you were kind of afraid to go to God. You, you, you thought of God as your God. You thought of God as maybe someone who takes care of you. But you don't really think of him as a friend. Of course, the Greeks, the Romans, the Gentiles, they looked at their gods as capricious and mean. And you basically just wanted your God to kind of leave you alone. You sacrificed to keep him happy, but you, you, didn't, you certainly didn't think of gods as a friend. But then Jesus comes along and the Bible talks about him as our friend. And that idea is kind of awesome. It's just kind of amazing when you think of Jesus Christ is my friend. Well, the New Testament presents him that way. So today I wanted us to continue the thought we started last week about Jesus Christ is my friend. And we want to look at seven ways that Jesus is your friend. And we take this from the uh, story of the rich of, of Lazarus when Lazarus passed away. The Bible calls says that Jesus was Lazarus' good friend, and we see seven things in this story, this passage, in John chapter eleven, that indicates Jesus' friendship with Lazarus, and Jesus is our friend in the same way. So first of all, we see that Jesus is my friend because he wants to perfect me, not pamper me. A friend, a real friend, is someone who wants you to do better. A real friend is someone who cares about your long-term welfare, not just your short-term comfort. And Jesus is concerned about our long-term welfare. And so Jesus is not someone who's going to pamper you. He's not someone who's going to, to not look for your long-term interests. And sometimes your long-term interests are not always the most comfortable. We pick up the story in John chapter 11 and verse 1. <clears throat> A man named Lazarus was sick. He lived in Bethany with his sisters, Mary and Martha. Now Bethany's not far from Jerusalem. This is the Mary who had later poured an expensive perfume on the Lord's feet and wiped them with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was sick. So the two sisters sent a message to Jesus telling him, Lord, your dear friend is very sick. Now that phrase there is important. It says, your dear friend. So obviously, they at least considered Lazarus a dear friend of Jesus. But when Jesus heard about it, he said, Lazarus' sickness will not end in death. No, it happened for the glory of God, so that the Son of God will receive glory from this. Now, Jesus was two or three days away from Bethany, walking, and Lazarus was sick, obviously sick enough to die from it. But the Bible says that Jesus waited before he went back to Lazarus, before he went to see him. The sisters at least thought if Jesus had come straight away, he might have prevented him from dying. But Jesus knew that God had a bigger picture in mind, that God had something else in mind. And he was going to use Lazarus' illness and death to make a, or to make a uh, theological statement that this was going to be used for the glory of the kingdom. And so we see that God will do things for us. Jesus is our friend, but he's going to do what's best for us. And sometimes that's not always the most comfortable for us. Sometimes our comfort depends on not changing much. A lot of us don't like a lot of change. We like to be comfortable where we are. 
But Jesus has not come to make us comfortable. He came to make us holy. He came to make us better. And sometimes that's going to require uh, something more of us. The second thing we notice is that Jesus lays his life on the line for his friends. Going back to verse 5 of this passage, <clears throat> So although Jesus loved Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, he stayed where he was for the next two days. Finally, he said to his disciples, let's go back to Judea. But his disciples objected. Rabbi, they said, only a few days ago, the people in Judea were trying to stone you. Are you going there again? And Jesus replied, there are 12 hours of daylight every day. During the day, people, <clears throat> during the day, people can walk safely. They can see because they have the light of the world. But at night there is a danger of stumbling because they have no light. And then he said, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but now I'll go and wake him up. Now, Jesus deliberately delayed his return to Bethany because the Jews had a belief that after a person died, that the spirit hung around the body for three days. And after three days, the spirit would depart and the person would actually be completely, totally dead. This is kind of an oddly, odd idea to us, but that's what they believed. And so Jesus wanted to go back after everybody was 100% certain that Lazarus was indeed dead because he was going to raise him from the dead. Now, Jesus had done a lot of miracles, but the greatest of the miracles would be raising someone from the dead. This would prove his power beyond a shadow of a doubt. Uh, lots of people could do magic tricks, but very few people can raise you from the dead. And so Jesus was going to use this opportunity to prove his power, to prove his authority. And so he deliberately waited uh, until after the body had been in the ground for three days. This would prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that Lazarus wasn't just in a coma, but he was actually dead. And so this is why Jesus had waited to this point to go. Jesus is our friend because he lays his life on the line. Now, <clears throat> this is in the region of Judea, Bethany is. And Jesus' enemies, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the, the high priest crowd, they wanted Jesus dead. They viewed him as a threat to their power. They viewed Jesus as a false teacher. And they were mostly afraid that Jesus was going to declare himself to be the Messiah and that he would lead a rebellion against the Romans. And they were afraid if he did that, and they knew he was very popular, he could possibly get a big crowd together. They were afraid that the Romans would come in and do away with the present leadership, and they certainly didn't want that. So... The, his enemies wanted him dead, and they had tried various ways to kill him. So Jesus had been spending most of his time in Galilee, where he was faced a lot less opposition from his enemies. But now he's going back to Judea. He's going back into to, uh, danger. And so his apostles are trying to say, well, maybe we shouldn't go back to Judea. It might be a dangerous place. But a friend lays down his life for you. A friend is one who is willing to go into danger for you. And so Jesus is going back to see Lazarus. John 15 says, There is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. The story of the New Testament, the story of the Bible, is Jesus was willing to lay down his life for us. Jesus left the glory of heaven. He was God, and yet he was willing to come to the earth and take human form and lay down his life for us. What greater love, what, what greater, greater proof that he is my friend and he was willing to die for me. Uh, and so Jesus is willing to lay his life down for us, and that is undoubtedly the highest level of friendship. We also notice that Jesus takes the initiative to be our friend. Jesus sought us. We did not seek him. Picking up again in verse 12, the disciples said, well, Lord, 
if he's sleeping, he will soon get better. When Jesus used the word sleeping, he really meant death, but that's not the way they took it. They thought Jesus meant Lazarus was simply sleeping, but Jesus meant Lazarus had died. So he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and for your sakes, I'm glad I wasn't there. For now, you'll really believe. And again, Jesus is saying, God has a bigger purpose with this. Yes, Lazarus has died, but God is going to use the death of Lazarus to prove that I am the Messiah, to prove that God has not abandoned man. Come, let's go to him. Thomas, nicknamed the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let's go too and die with Jesus. They were scared to death to go back to Judea. They were afraid that Jesus' enemies would track him down and put him to death. They knew that they wanted, they knew that Jesus' enemies wanted to arrest him and charge him with various crimes. And they just thought, well, if we go back to Judea, he will be arrested. And at this point, Thomas says, well, we'll just all die with him. So uh, they were kind of fatalistic about this, but they, uh, they were willing to go. And again, Jesus has a bigger picture here. Jesus is willing to be, take the initiative. Jesus is willing to, to do what is necessary to save us and to bring us to where we must be. So now, Jesus promises to get us through the tough times. It's interesting that, contrary to some teachings today, Jesus doesn't promise us that everything's going to be easy. He doesn't promise us that life is going to be without trouble and that we're going to be wealthy and healthy. And there's a lot of that out there being taught, that if you're a Christian, that you have to be wealthy and happy and healthy and God wants you. Well, that's, that's not simply what the Bible's teaching. Jesus does not tell us that everything's going to be wonderful when you become a Christian, when you follow him. Matter of fact, he tells us flat out that uh, there's going to be some persecution. There's going to be some rough times. He doesn't promise us that everything's going to be roses. But he does promise us that he will get us through the difficult times. So let's pick up the story again in verse 17. When Jesus arrived at Bethany, he was told that Lazarus had already been in his grave for four days. Now remember, this was necessary to, to prove to the Jews that Lazarus really was dead and he wasn't just uh, in a coma. Bethany was only a few miles down the road from Jerusalem. And many of the people had come to console Martha and Mary in their loss. When Martha got word that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him. But Mary stayed in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that God will give you whatever you ask. And Jesus told her, your brother will live again. So... Martha is confused, and she's thinking, basically, she tells Jesus, well, if you had just come when we sent for you, everything would be great. Everything would be fine. He would be alive. But Jesus is comforting her. He is reassuring her. He says, don't worry. Your brother is going to be fine. He's going to live again. She doesn't understand what he's talking about. She's, she thinks he's talking about in the resurrection. But again, Jesus promises, and as our friend, he says, I'm going to get you through the tough times. Life can be difficult. This last year has been difficult on a lot of people. A lot of people have been sick. Friends have died. People have lost their jobs. It's been a rough year. But even outside of that, most lives have difficult times. We, we all have gone through periods when we didn't have much money, when we couldn't pay the bills, when we we're looking for jobs, when there's unhappiness of one sort or another in, the, in families or in our lives. Sometimes we don't get along with folks. Sometimes there's trouble. That's part of life. It's going to happen. Some of it's our fault. Some of it has nothing to do with it. It's not our fault at all. It's just part of being in this world. And again, Jesus never promised that we wouldn't have the difficult times. 
But he did promise us that if we trust him, if we follow him, if we accept him as our Lord and master, that he will get us through the tough times. That, that we're going to come out just of this just fine. We're going to be all right. And so Jesus has promised us that we're going to be okay. Now, of all the things that Jesus can do for us, and he is our friend, he's our best friend. Jesus will never desert us. We saw this last week. Jesus, Jesus always wants what's best for us. Jesus is going to take care of us, get us through the rough times. But the greatest gift is that Jesus offers eternal life for believing in him. Of all the issues in the universe, of all the problems, of all the bad things, being lost is by far the worst. We know that we're not going to get out of this life alive. We know that there are going to be difficult times. All of us, if you live very long in this world, are going to lose people. We're going to lose family. We're going to lose friends. Death is a reality. We know that we're going to have days when things don't go well. We know that we're going to have sicknesses and so forth. But being lost overshadows everything else. When we sin, and all of us are sinners, we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that that places us in a lost condition before God. And if something isn't done about that, we will be sent to hell for eternity. There can be no greater catastrophe than that. What can a man give in exchange for his soul? In other words, even if somebody could give you the entire world, so what? You wouldn't enjoy it for very long anyway. And then you must face eternity. And so Jesus is my friend. Because he offers me the greatest gift possible. Jesus offers me eternal life. I once had a, a good friend of mine come to me and say, Steve, I need to borrow a couple of thousand dollars. And he said, here's why. I said, no. I said, I don't want to know. I don't need to know why. You need the money, I'll give it to you. As long as I've got it, it's yours. How much greater is it for Jesus Christ to come to us and say, I will give you eternal life? You know, if I need a couple of thousand bucks and a friend of mine says, well, here, here's the money. That, that's fine. That's great. That's, that's a friend. But how many of your friends can offer you eternity? How many of your friends can say, I will save you. I will give you eternity in heaven with God. That's a friend. And Jesus Christ is offering us eternal life. Of all the things that, that you could be offered, you know, if somebody came up and offered you a million dollars, well, that's a friend. But the million is not going to last forever. But eternal life lasts forever. And so there is no greater gift. There is nothing comparable to eternal life. And my friend Jesus has offered me eternal life. And the condition he puts on it is that I must believe in him. I must place my faith in him and to say, I trust you. I believe you. I accept your gift to me. I can't earn it. There's not anything I can do to deserve it. He says, I'm not asking you to, to do something worthy of salvation. He says, I will give you salvation if you place your faith in me. Do you believe that I am who I claim to be? Do you believe that I have the power to give you eternal life? Do you believe that I died for you? That I paid your sin debt? And so my great friend Jesus Christ has offered me eternal life 
There can be no greater gift. There can be no greater friend. He laid down his life for me. He wants what's best for me. And then he says, here, I will give you eternal life. It's a gift. You cannot buy it. You can't earn it. You can't do enough to get it. Only by faith in Jesus Christ can I have eternal life. And my friend Jesus has offered me that great gift. In verses 24 and 29, just after Jesus has told Martha, he says, your brother will live again. She says, well, yes, he will rise when everyone else rises at the last day. But Jesus told her, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Jesus says, no, I'm not just talking about the resurrection. I'm talking about I have the power of life right now. And so Jesus was a friend of Martha and her brother. And Jesus says, I'm going to take care of this problem. I am going to make him alive. I am going to give him life. He then goes on to say, Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this, Martha? Well, yes, Lord, she told him. I have always believed you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one who has come into the world from God. Then she turned to, returned to Mary. She called Mary aside from the mourners and told her, The teacher is here and wants to see you. So Mary immediately went to see him. Jesus wanted to assure these sisters that he had come to take care of their problem. Now, in this case, the problem was death. Lazarus had died. Now, there's only one thing a dead man needs, and that's life. A dead man doesn't need a better quality of food. He doesn't need a better job. He doesn't need more entertainment. He just needs life. And Jesus is the only one that can bring life. This story is so important in the biblical account because it proves that Jesus not only has the power over the wind and the waves and uh, the sickness and, and all the things that he did, but Jesus Christ actually has power over life and death. Jesus can conquer death. He's the only one that can do that. The very first prophecy in the entire Bible it's when God came into the garden following the sin of Adam and Eve. And he turned to Satan. And he said, there's going to be warfare between your offspring and the offspring of the woman, talking of Jesus Christ. And the offspring of Satan is death. He says, he, Jesus, will crush your head. You will strike him on the heel. And Jesus, as we know, died on the cross. But he didn't stay dead. Jesus defeated Death. Paul said this is the greatest truth in the universe. The greatest single truth is that Jesus defeated death. He rose from the dead. Because when he rose from the dead, he defeated death itself. And so Jesus came to defeat death. And we know he did that. And so Jesus has the power to give life. Not just a few more years of life. In this case, Lazarus would live a little longer and then again he would die. But Jesus is here talking about eternal life. And so our best friend has the power of life and death. Now, we've all got good friends. We all have friends who some are powerful, some are not, some are wealthy, some are not. They're able to do various things for us and help us. In, but nobody, none of our other friends can do this. None of our other friends can give life. That's beyond our power. But my friend Jesus is able to give life itself. He is able to, to, to give me eternal life, to raise me from the dead someday, and take me with him back into heaven, and I will live forever. That is a true friend indeed. We also see that Jesus is our friend because he loves us. Jesus really cares. Now, when the Bible uses the word love, it's used in a different way than we normally use it. 
We think of love as an emotion, a feeling. We talk about falling in and out of love and so forth. That's not the biblical concept. The biblical concept of love is doing what's best for you. Well, Jesus loves me. He's my friend. He does what's best for me. And what's best for me is to live eternally. And Jesus is going to take care of that. Now, we'll pick up the story again in verse 30. Jesus had stayed outside the village at the place where Martha met him. When the people who were at the house consoling Mary saw her leave so hastily, they assumed she was going to Lazarus' grave to weep. So they followed her there. When Mary arrived and saw Jesus, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you only had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and saw the other people wailing with her, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how much he loved him. This is an interesting passage in the sense that Jesus wept. This is a very famous passage. The idea that Jesus cared enough to weep. Now he knew that he was going to raise Lazarus from the dead. He knew that someday Lazarus would live forever. But he still cared so much for Lazarus and his sisters that this touched him deeply. And he could see their sorrow. He could see their their anguish. And so Jesus himself was moved to weep. His compassion was amazing. Jesus really loved them. Jesus loves us. That's why he is our friend. He loves us. This idea, it was so amazing to the, to the Jews. The idea that God could care about the individual that much. They kind of thought of God as a national God who took care of all the Jews. and They thought of God as kind of an impersonal God. But Jesus came and he's a personal God. He cares about each person, each individual. And Jesus loves us. He is our friend. Most of us have friends that we know care about us and love us. But sometimes the people we think love us will show something that's not necessarily in that vein. Sometimes a person that we depended on will disappoint us or, or do something that, that harms us. But we never have to worry about that with Jesus. Jesus loves us. He'll always love us. Occasionally we will have a falling out with a friend. And for a while, at least, that relationship is damaged or broken. Jesus will never leave me. He has promised me. He will never. No matter what we do, we, we disappoint him. We may turn our back on him. But he's not going to depart from us. He's not going to leave us. Now, we may turn against him for so long that we die in that condition and we will be judged for our own actions. But it's not because Jesus has abandoned us. It's because we abandon him. But Jesus loves us. He cares about us. He will be there for us. And as long as we place our faith in him and love him, he has promised he's going to take care of us and he will ultimately save us and give us eternal life. And so Jesus loved. And then finally in this story we see that Jesus is our friend because he's the only one who can set us free. He is the only one who can break the bonds of sin and death. Notice the rest of the passage. Jesus, once more, deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor, for he's been there four days. Then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I know that you always hear me. 
But I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out with his hands and feet wrapped in strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Lazarus had died. They had buried him. They had wrapped him in the traditional clothing of the Jewish dead. Lazarus had been conquered by death. He was a slave to death. There was not a thing in the world he could do to get out of death himself. Jesus is our friend because he delivers us from slavery to things that we can't control. When we become sinners, we basically sell ourselves in slavery to sin. The first time we sin, we kill ourselves. Our spirit dies. And so we become enslaved to sin. Paul makes a big case about this in Romans. <clears throat> that we, you, you, when you become a sinner, you are a slave to sin. And we can't break out of that on our own. And when we die, we certainly can't break out of that on our own. When, when we go into the grave, we're dead. We, we can't do anything about it. But Jesus is my best friend because of the, he's the only one on the planet that can deliver me from my slavery to sin. He can break the bonds of sin. Some people are so wrapped up in it they can't stop doing it. But Jesus is able to give us that power to break the sin. And then ultimately, he's the one who breaks the power of death. As Christians, we know that we're going to die. But we also know that if we place our faith in Christ, we will live again. And so just as Jesus delivered Lazarus from the dead, called him out of the tomb, someday he will call us out of the tomb. And we will be free from death forever. Do we, really, do we really have a friend or not? I mean, Jesus Christ is our friend, and we are so grateful. Thank you for being with us today. We'll talk to you next time.